winning is great. Hot take, I know. It's in human nature to be competitive, to prove you're harder, better, faster, stronger. The desire to be number one is in our blood, so it feels good when we win. And I mean any kind of victory. You're a fighting games player. You've beaten AI opponents in countless video games. It felt good, didn't it? You've defeated your friends in a low stakes 1v1 just for bragging rights. Some of us reach high ranks in our online games with every battle being more difficult than the other. An even lower number has visited events and won tournaments. A massive achievement regardless of its size because not many can deal with the pressure of needing to perform in the spot. Some truly special players go above and beyond and win major tournaments with thousands of people participating in them. These people embody our ever burning strive to be better to prove to ourselves and others that we are, in fact, the best. But there's still a step above. Did you follow any sports at any point in your life? If you did, and it doesn't matter which, you know that some legends went down in history as some of the greatest to ever do it. You have names like Pele, Diego Maradona and Lionel Messi in football, Jim Clark, Ayrton Senna and Michael Schumacher in Formula 1, or Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson and LeBron James in basketball. Every sport has its goats. And yes, we do tend to compare eSport athletes to those traditional sports because that's the best, the closest and the easiest to explain comparison. And as traditional sports have their goats, so do fighting games. But unlike traditional sports, we have multitudes of disciplines within the same relatively defined genre. And therefore, our list of legends are long and all-encompassing. Most of them are incredibly well-liked revered even, and the different communities within the larger FGC tend to respect those of the different ones. And while this verisimilitude of unity is not far from the truth, at some point someone inevitably starts another shit flinging on Twitter, claiming that one goat is goatier than another and the third one didn't even deserve their status in the first place. And while such lunacy isn't very tolerated, it is true that not every champion and not every legend is equal. We live in the golden age of fighting games. The big three releases are all recent and the smaller games are holding their own too. We're seeing more and more new names popping up on the larger stages of huge events. But let's not forget there are 30 years of history that led up to this moment. Yes, with the internet becoming widely available in 2010s, we remembered the giants of this era better. They are simply better documented than those who came before. Still, many of the early names endured. Even if they're known to many for the weight their accomplishments bear, rather than seeing them for themselves. People like Justin Wong, Daigo Mihara, Nuki, Jackie Tran, Alex Valle, Tokido, Ryan Hart, Perfect Legend. They've been here since the very beginning and left their marks, laid the foundation of this community. Some of them are known for dominating in a single discipline, while others cast their nets wider and became champions of multiple games. Times were different back then. Sure, there were fewer players at any given offline event, so mathematically it was easier to win. But at the same time, it was the Wild West. There was no internet in every household and you couldn't simply hop into online matches to practice inside a competitive environment. They didn't have YouTube guides detailing all the pros, cons, frame data, move properties, optimal combos and wake up options. People met in real life and shared some cool combos they discovered or encouraged others to train by going on insane win streaks utilizing some previously unknown tech. Nowadays we have a generation of players that reap the benefits of both the nature of the VGC and technological advances. They train day and night, watch replays, practice matchups with their training partners online and then go out and dominate the field. But in the past it was not too uncommon to just enter several tournaments at EVO and go home with several high placements. Nowadays this is more of a conscious career choice with its pros and cons. Let's take a look at some of the best fighting game players of recent years by Ni Jaemin arguably the greatest Tekken player that has ever lived. He got interested in the King of the Iron Fist tournament because it was very popular at the arcades he frequented. Having fallen in love with the series, he dedicated himself to it entirely and it paid off. Ni has won a frankly ridiculous amount of tournaments. Among them are several EVO titles, mini majors and show matches. No TVT crowns yet though, so even he has something to strive towards. His holistic approach to mastering Tekken is fairly unorthodox at his level. We have pros that have mastered 1, 2 and sometimes 3 characters, they're their signatures. And then there's Ni, who has mastered Tekken. No, but seriously, tell us which character Ni is known for. Is it Brian? 
Of course it is. Brian, knee strikes, you get it. But wait, it's also Steve Fox. Paul Phoenix, you say? Oh, and Devil Jin. And Feng and Jin, Marduk, Negan, even Claudio and Kazumi. You get the idea. The way Ni fundamentally approaches Tekken would simply not allow him to quote unquote waste time on any other fighting game at this level. Tekken is by no means an easy game, and the amount of ever hungry challengers is always knocking at his door. One of them, in fact, smashed this door to pieces. Our son Ash, inarguably the greatest Tekken 7 player in history. The way he dominated the scene ever since he appeared at the tail end of 2018 is something we haven't seen before. He did to Tekken what Max Verstappen did to Formula 1, made it boring for many because you know who would win in the end or at the very least you wouldn't bet against him. We've come to a point where even a grand final reset against him would be an upset and a sensation. And while his raw talent might be something no one can replicate, do not delude yourself into thinking that Arsene doesn't work as hard and even harder than anyone else at his level. In fact, his results weren't up to his enormously high standards a couple of years ago, while he was dabbling in the King of Fighters Pro scene to some decent success. But ever since he made the conscious decision to dedicate his career wholly to Tekken 7, he became nigh unstoppable. Now, this might be a simple coincidence, or maybe this was a simple issue of rekindling his own motivation. We will never know. But the fact is, Arson Ash is solely a Tekken player nowadays. We are not sharing him with KOF. We have another example. There is an incredible amount of competition in Street Fighter. Its top level is arguably the most stacked out of any premier fighting game. Yet we have someone who managed to win the Capcom Cup, an event that is notoriously difficult to get qualified for, let alone navigate the format of, twice. Saul Leonardo Mena II, also known as Mena RD, is one of the greatest Street Fighter players of all time, and he proves this time and again. He approaches his career as a pro player in a very particular way. He has his friends and family to provide support and give him motivation, training partners to constantly get better, and even a therapist who helps him not to get lost inside his own mind. And as we're aware, it's paying off. Now, not to say that Man RD has never tried to play any other game, he has dabbled in Injustice 2 and Guilty Gear Strive somewhat. But he hasn't achieved anything to write home about, a clear contrast to his demigod status in Street Fighter. On the other side of the medal, we have people who make a conscious decision to try to master, not at the same time most often, and then compete in several fighting games. Justin Wong's and Ryan Hart's legacy of picking up any game and instantly being good at it, up to a point of winning multiple EVOs, is carried by Dominic Sonic Fox McLean. Yes, Sonic Fox is still primarily known for their Mortal Kombat exploits, winning everything there is to win, but aside from four EVO titles in NRS games, they have won DBFZ and Schoolgirls EVOs as well. And while their NRS records leave no room for any doubt, they're still facing one of the biggest issues a multi-game champion could encounter, being upstaged. There is only a finite amount of time you can dedicate yourself to any given task, and it's simply unfeasible to remain atop three mountains at once. In MK, the notorious Chilean twins have sown the seeds of doubt of whether or not Sonic Fox really is the best MK player on the planet. When the Fox was actively playing DBFZ, they had but one challenger, a fierce rival in Goichi. Nowadays, however, the DBFZ streets are run by Vava, Nitro, Yasha and Kane since then and few remember Sonic Fox as the goat of the scene. As for Skullgirls, a common attempt to dismiss their status in that game is the fact that it's much more niche with fewer players, as well as their very close, non-dominant back and forth with the Kill Sage. This is of course absolute lunacy as Skullgirls is a respectable title with a heavy burden of execution, just as Sonic Fox loves it. A more recent example of a multi-game champion is the Swedish TSM legend William Leffenhjelte, he had a giant killer status in Super Smash Bros. Melee for a long time before he managed to break the mold and win his first EVO in 2018. But after that, he unexpectedly toned down his involvement with Melee, and since 2021 he has been focusing mainly on GGST. Having come close to winning EVO on several occasions, he finally managed to close the Gestalt last year, becoming a two-time EVO champion in two different games. This result was only possible because of his incredible dedication and stubbornness. He never stopped trying, but who knows what would have happened had he continued to dedicate his usual amount of time to Smash. The man himself claims he still very much loves Melee, but it's very unlikely that he will compete in it at any point in this year. 
and it's understandable. Leffen has something very tangible in his grasp with Strive and it would be imprudent to let it go. But which is better, to be dominant in one game or very competitive and multiple? I can hear you asking. And just like with many things in life, the answer to this question is very complex. On the one hand, even reaching the levels of dominance some of these legends are showing isn't something you and I are ever going to experience. You need to not only be the best, but also most consistent. The former is an impossible task in itself, but the latter is simply draining. The burden of expectation placed on these players is unfathomable. You can't have an off day, you can't lose your focus, you need to always be able to perform on the spot. Otherwise, you're instantly facing scrutiny and questions like Is Dash Fight Video Watcher 69 washed? On the other hand, to win in different disciplines, you need that. Discipline. It's very difficult for us, mere mortals, to let go of our bad habits. Even more difficult is to let go of our practices and muscle memory we were building up during half a dozen thousand hours. But pro players aren't us. It's literally in their job description. The ability to improvise, adapt, overcome. And well, in fighting games you still have some transferable skills between one series and another. The concepts aren't as far apart as one might think, and the ultimate goal is always to reduce your opponent's health to zero. This is a testament to the adaptability of the esports pro players. There have even been players who switched games quite radically. No Gamsu Yeonjin is a League of Legends player who switched to Overwatch and played for Boston Uprising in the Overwatch League, before retiring and coming back to League. There was another LoL player famous for this. Lee Reach J1 was a Heroes of the Storm legend who was literally nicknamed Jordan before he made the switch. And yeah, both LoL and HOTS are MOBAs, but they're quite wildly different. There was also a huge amount of players who went back and forth between Counter-Strike, Valorant and other first-person shooters. But that's the genre with the highest skill transference, you just click heads. We're joking, but you get the idea. What we're trying to say is that no matter which angle you approach this from, both are exceptionally impressive. Long-term dominance is something that sounds more impressive on paper, but in the long run it creates viewer fatigue and the fans, bored and tired of the only guy winning everything, start trying to find reasons to downplay this success. We mirror traditional sports again with this. It's just the car for Max Verstappen. German Bundesliga? That's the Farmers League. And Bayern Munich always wins. Arsenal Nash only picks top tiers to carry him to the tournaments. Familiar music, isn't it? But multi-game competitiveness could also be both overblown and downplayed, depending on the context. Is winning an EVO event for a game with 100 registrations as impressive as being triumphant in the record-breaking Street Fighter VI tournament? Not really. But that doesn't negate the skill, work and dedication required to even get to that level in the new game. You have probably had your own opinion on which of these you find more compelling, more impressive. And I don't think we tried to argue one way or the other, but hopefully we gave you more context and more food for thought for the times when some overzealous fan will start trying steering the pot on Twitter again.